Tom Strong, the president and CEO of Canbim and principal at Wired Dock Construction. Thank you so much for tuning in for this week's uh, Feature Friday. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, owners and, and project life cycle. Uh, the, the theme for the uh, for the talk here is unlocking the value of BIM for owners. And I'm going to welcome Joe um, Eikenzier. I got that right, I think. Director of uh, Building Life Cycle Solutions uh, for North America for Imagine It Technologies. Uh, Joe's joining us from Denver. Uh, Joe's had a very extensive career working in uh, in design, working on hospital projects. He's been with Imagine It for over 20 years. He manages a giant team, I think over close to 40 people uh, across North America that are focused on the entire life cycle of a uh, building and uh, he has deep expertise with building life cycle. Uh, so Joe, thanks for joining us. Thanks for making time. Um, excited to, to hear your talk. Uh, a couple of house, housekeeping items before I go too far. Uh, I just want to remind everyone, we want to have these uh, these sessions as interactive as possible. So there is a panel off to the side uh, for Q&A. So, you know, navigate that panel. It's easy to get in there uh, and ask questions. So please do that. And then we'll uh, we'll manage those questions at the end after Joe wraps up. And uh, I also want to thank our sponsors. We have a number of sponsors that make these events possible, especially our platinum sponsors. And uh, Joe, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you very much. And thanks, everybody, for taking some time out of your day to join us. As we're looking at some different things through here, uh, the intent that we've got is to be able to take a look at what's happening and what owners want out of the idea of them and what types of things can, can the design community do to work with those owners, the construction community do to work with those owners in this, this BIM world that we are in and have been in for quite some time. As, as was mentioned through the overall uh, agenda items and things that we're looking for, this is the me before the beard came around. Uh, recently grew it out and my son decided that I'm not allowed to shave it off anymore. He just can't see me without it anymore. So that being said, it, it's the idea of looking at some of the different tools that we've got to make to make this transition of data from this rich environment that we've got in BIM to something that owners can leverage later on. And, for all people throughout that life cycle, where are places that you as an individual can add in some value at your spot? Ideally, there's some level of business and revenue and you get paid for some of the things that you're doing here, but there's also places where it's just knowing is gonna be half the battle and what can we do to make this, this built environment, this ecosystem that we're working in that much better, hopefully, just a little incrementally better than where it was before. So we'll be looking at some different methods and and how we're going about that. In in the context to try and make sure that we're looking at things from the roughly same perspective, I wanted to start off with a couple of pieces from a background to be able to make sure that 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 foundation is laid. And if I'm talking about certain things, we're at least all coming at it from the from these few points, the the same perspective or at least closer to the same perspective. We may not be exactly aligned, but we'll be a little bit closer. As to part of that background, the idea behind it is, what are owners looking at? What do they want to get out of it? What are they expressing today? So imagine it has been doing a survey for the last five years. We're still pending on the 2020 survey, but uh, we've been polling architects, contractors, owners, about all sorts of things over the last number of years. and I've, pulled out a few pieces that we've gathered. And yeah, this is part of it here. It's the industry, we were saying, of the group that we were polling, if we focus it down to just the owners, what are you looking to get out of BIM for your facility management? And this is the trending and the types of answers we got. The, the low-hanging fruit, if you want to call it that, are the things that are over on the left side of this, this chart. They want to get information about space, area, square footage, square meters inside their buildings. They want to get information about the assets, the, in the Revit world, we'll call it component families, but the things that matter, then maybe they depreciate those or they just need to track where certain medical carts are inside a hospital, whatever it might happen to be. Uh, they want to be able to get manufacturer specification information out of a model. That's kind of, a, to me, a little bit of a questionable one of you know, how often are we able to or delivering on that type of information. Um, some of them were saying, I want to get a point cloud out of them. Okay, we'll accept that, move on. 
uh, maintenance schedules. That one, I'm very happy to see it decreasing over time. Because in my opinion, if we're looking at something like maintenance schedules, that's not part of the, that's part of a facility management solution. Nothing that would come from the overall BIM process in design and construction. We're not going to get those maintenance schedules. That's that's FM. That's operations. Um, and then they're also looking for COBE or IFC based data to be able to send information from one platform to another, get things moving around. Now, all of these were based off of a survey that was throughout the US and Canada. From the Imaginet side, we've got offices of coast to coast, north to south, everywhere through there. Um, I guess we'd say as far north as probably Edmonton, if I have my geography correct. Um, going down into, we'll say, South Florida, South Texas would be the, the farthest south. So it's results from everywhere throughout our footprint, which is US and Canada. Um, I don't believe we got any international or sorry, uh, across the ocean results from what we're looking at through here, but it is a mix of US and Canadian responses through there. We just went out to our whole footprint. Um, but this is, this is consistent and especially for those items on the left-hand side, space and asset, that's been very consistent across all time. And really from an owner's end, it's something they have to do. You have to know how many square feet are you working with? What departments are they in? Are you doing leasing? So we need to do mobile calculations or something to be able to pull it back. There's all sorts of possibilities of what might come from space and certainly the assets of tracking the things that you care about inside your building. So th those are good. Uh, point clouds, again, I think there's an argument to be made that that's not necessarily BIM. Maybe it feeds into BIM, but isn't necessarily BIM itself. It's, it's a piece of it, so I'll, I'll, I'll accept it. But it's, it's a debat debatable point. So that's, that's one part of what they say they're looking for. And that's good. But then we go to a, another question, and we came back and said, well, what are you receiving at the end of a project when you're getting some sort of a turnover? As, as an owner, what, are, what do you get? And we've gotten to a point where there's you know, over 50% were receiving some type of a model. Were they doing anything with it? That's, that's another question. <laughs> but what were you receiving? Uh, the, major the stronger majority were receiving CAD drawings, and if you compare the two, that means that you know over 100% were receiving BIM models and CAD drawings, so some number of owners are receiving both. And almost all of them are getting PDFs. So we get very quickly to a spot where we're saying, I want to get area information, I want to get asset information, I want to get all these things out of BIM, but most of the time I'm just getting PDF drawings at the end of it. So that data isn't necessarily making its way all the way through. It's what I want. It's maybe not what they're getting or maybe not necessarily what they know how to use. And if we look at that idea of what it gets back to how to use, and by the way, this, this particular chart was just from the very last uh, survey that we had, so just last year's survey in 2019. Uh, if we look at that and, and compare these, so the first one was saying, what do we want? This is saying, what are we actually receiving? And then after that, it gets to say, what are we using? So one of the questions we had for just the owner agencies was, what are you, what is your facility management solution that you're using? Primarily, we'll say for space and asset, because those are those two things that were pretty well universal for everybody who's managing a facility. Um, and this one was a, a checkbox question. It wasn't a fill in the blank. And so the first, first couple of years that we were asking it, we, among other things, we were saying, do you are using an IWMS, an Integrated Workplace Management System, CAFM, Computer Aided Facility Management System. To some extent, you could say those are almost one and the same. There's some marketing and branding between those two different types of statements. Um, but really what stood out is after we did that for a little bit, we said, well, wait a minute, we're missing something here. And in the last year, so we last year, we added in an option to choose in there some other types of things in Excel was one of the other things that we added in. Instead of being facility management specific solutions, you know, Archibos, Maximo, and so on, um, we pulled Excel in there, you know, other office types of applications. I, I don't remember if we had something like Power BI in there, but we, you know, those other pieces were minimal. But when we're looking at this, the number of people that say that they use Excel to help manage their facilities is greater than the number of people that they say they use an integrated workplace management system which gets to that, that IWMS is going to be something where instead of just being uh, space and asset, we're getting to all aspects. It's a 
maybe more comprehensive global facility management solution where you've got things that'll work into emergency preparedness, um, you've got asset depreciation, maintenance, and all those other things. So it gets into all sorts of, you know, hoteling, fun stuff. It's a little bit more of a more robust than just a computer-aided facility management system. At least that's what the marketing would have to tell. So if we're looking at this and trying to, to pull some, some thoughts coming from it, we've got, I want space and asset data. I'm getting some things that may or may not actually give me space and asset data, especially if it's PDFs that are coming through. And once we get into the building, I might not be using a system that can integrate with them at all. Okay, so there, there's, there's a challenge here. And really what it comes down to is we're thinking about what's happening for most owner agencies is that there's not, they're behind in the overall uh, BIM process. They're, they're behind everything. The, the common thing that'll be said is that uh, Canada is behind the US and then owners will be behind that even. I think Canada is catching up very, very quickly. And I'm, I'm not really convinced that that's really the case on a, on a regular basis. I know I've also got a, a filtered view of everything. So I'll, I'll admit to that for sure. But there, there's this place where if the owner agencies aren't using something that can interact with them, then where are they coming from? What do they need? If, if we think about the day-to-day -day practice of a facility manager, the vast majority of their time is working with more two-dimensional documents. In fact, if we were to look at things and I were to give you a drawing that looks like this, this might be something that a typical facility manager team would be looking at. They've, whether it's a digital something, they've got it on a, an iPad or a tablet of some sort, or if it's a piece of paper that they're looking at, it's a flat 2D document of a floor plan. And this is what they're used to seeing. This is what their, their people out in the field are typically looking at and wanting to see. And the question would be, if, if they're getting something like this, is it CAD, is it BIM, are they getting the data they want to? There gets to be a question of you know, the ownership, the intellectual property that goes behind it. But do, you, do your owners that you're working with know what is possible and what they could be receiving? Because a document like this could easily be CAD, 2D, 2D CAD, could easily be a 3D model. There's really no way to tell about it. In reality, that particular screenshot was one that was hybrid. There was some 2D documentation of, of basically I took a file and linked in a CAD, AutoCAD drawing in the background and modeled some things around it for you know imaginary renovation projects, whatever you want to call it. But the question would be is, does your owner customer care about the data that's there? Chances are the answer is yes, but are they able to utilize it and how can they utilize it? Maybe we're getting that data to them by sending information out of Revit to an Excel spreadsheet, and then we go from Excel or wherever, or to Kobe, or to, there's all sorts of possibilities, but we need to be able to think about what is my customer, my owner, able to consume? What am I able to produce? What will they actually utilize? And that gets to be the, the things that we need to think about as we're going forward into considering how are we going to unlock the value of them to the owners. We have to know what they're capable of pulling off. So that's going to be the background that we have for this, to understand the, the place that the owners are coming from. And if we're going to be looking to make this transition of how can we unlock that value, there gets to be a place where there will be a need to, to change your perspective. If you are on the design side, if you happen to be on the construction side of what is happening in, in the construction design and maintenance and management of buildings, we need to start thinking about it from somebody else's point of view so that we can work with them better and, and get a better unified system. Now, if we're talking about this from, from the idea of BIM, there's one other piece. Maybe this could have gone in background, but oh well, I set those slides up this way. Um, when we're thinking about BIM as an overall thing that we're working with inside the design community, we've seen a graphic that looks something like this time and time and time again in different ways, different formats, uh, but it's the whole circle of life of BIM where we go from design to construction and maintenance and it's all around this BIM world. And BIM, BIM, BIM is everything. And for, for one perspective of looking at things and maybe for 
some of the past couple of decades, this was pretty darn accurate, but it's not, it's not how an owner would look at it. If we're looking at this, this circle of life of what's happening with the building, it's not just them that's out there. And, and the definition of them, whether we're calling it building information model, building information management, uh, there, there's all sorts of things that will go through there. It's the idea of well, let's have this physical building represented digitally. It's a little bit different from digital twin. We'll get into that in a moment. But this circle of life that we're looking at, it, it's been common. And from a design side, I would argue it's fairly accurate. But from an owner's perspective, it's not them, it's data. Data is what drives what happens inside a building. And of all those things, a, a Revit model or BIM in a broad sense is just one source of possible data that's going into the operation and management of a building. And when we say that, it's you know, the building will be able to get you know, area information, asset information. We'll talk about a bunch of these things coming through. But when we're looking at the overall scope of data that can come into a building, there's also going to be things like sensors, uh, Internet of Things coming into a building where we could have you know, HVAC equipment feeding information into a facilities management tool that will start proactively sending signals to say this this is bad, this is good, whatever's happening. Um, lights turning on and off, feeding that information to the system to know what areas of a particular building are being used more often. None of that is stuff that would be coming from BIM. There's a whole bunch of other things. You'll get data input that's going to be people. People putting in support tickets of it's too cold in here, it's too hot in here, or the sink is backing up, or that's going to be human input to support tickets. That's an extra set of data that has nothing to do with BIM. Um, and I would argue somebody saying that the sink is backing up or there's a toilet overflowing is going to be much more important than did this data come from Revit, CAD, or a spreadsheet. You know, there's, there's an actual real problem that we've got to deal with in the building that takes a little bit of priority, and that's all data. So if we think about it, not in the sense of BIM is the center of the world, but data is the center of this universe, and BIM is one of those sources of data, we'll start, be, we'll start to get a an appreciation or an understanding of the ideas and concepts that are running around through somebody on the owner side of, of running with them and what that can be to them. One of the guys that I work with, so the, the group that I have, that, that I manage, is we've got a group that does work with uh, general building design and construction. We've got a, well, general building design and engineering, a group that focuses on a construction, a group that focuses on more industrial plant and factory type projects and then a group that does facilities management solely and the guy that's the one of the people in that facilities management group has always talked about them being the the holy grail of of data for owners because there's so much that's possible with it we just need to be able to define it better and by define it it's not defining them but define the data better so that we can use it and figure out how are we going to use it there's so much possible how do we boil that down to the core essence of what's really needed? If we're going to do that, one of the things that we really have to have to worry about, and this is definitely something that I've seen is a difference in broad sense. So I'm, I'm painting with a very, very broad brush right now, but it would be something that I would say is, is that the attitudes of some in the U.S. and some in Canada are a bit different over how are we sharing things and who owns the IP of a, of a design? And I'm not here to argue one side or the other of that, but what I will say is that if we're going to be trying to make a change in our environment to make, to make this BIM and data more valuable to owners and then thereby me, us, whoever you are, more valuable to owners and, and improving our industry, we do have to share. And if we are going to be sharing, this is a book from a few years back, but it's still valid that, as it says, it's a perfect complement, BIM, to collaboration because that's it's in the nature of BIM is we want it to be a collaborative environment. The, it's, it is part of that BIM process, in my opinion. So it's, it's something we have to start with knowing that I will share. I can share. If you're thinking about that as the very first question of am I able to to give a Revit model to my owner, to the contractors on a job, to whatever else, and you're not sure if that first statement is correct, let's get that resolved first, and then we can go on to everything else that follows from here. It, it does need that, 
that sharing piece, not just an export of data. If we're really going to be making changes, we're talking about something a little bit more fundamental than that. So with that as, as the baseline, if we get to the spot of being able to say, uh, we are able to share. We've got this one of many sources of data of BIM that is feeding into our owners. Then what do they want to get out of it? Because if we think about Revit, and we'll, we'll just assume that in most of the North America, Revit equals BIM. It's a fair statement. Um, when we're thinking about that, I can put in a parameter for anything I want inside Revit, attach it to any object, and I can attach any data that's possible in there. So the question becomes, what's important? What would an owner want to get out of that model so that I'm focusing on the things that add the best value instead of things that just don't matter very much? So the first thing of what an owner wants to get out of a model, and this is fairly universal, and I've mentioned it before, it's the idea of space management. And with the idea of, of BIM, of a building information model, it's it's part and parcel to what is BIM, right? If you go through and you've got a model, you've got rooms defined in the model, there's a question of how are you defining the rooms to the, are you doing net usable area or are you doing gross areas? Are you measuring the center lines of walls or finished surface of walls? There's, there's all sorts of pieces in there that can change how you're defining your areas, but they're there. You can use the nature of a room means it's, it's part of it. And in the, in the AutoCAD world, so if we go back a ways, if, if in my world, this is coming back 20 plus years, um, when I needed to get areas, I would go into AutoCAD and sketch a polyline and check the area of the polyline. And if I, if I was feeling particularly fancy that day, I'd tie that information into room tags or schedules and other types of things. But you would go through the process of creating a polyline for each and every uh, square foot, square meter of something that you wanted to track. And that's a very time consuming process, which is the CAD way of doing things. Polylining is a reality of CAD in a, in a facilities world. The BIM side, it's all just a byproduct of what we've got. There's a study that came out a while back that said in Carolina, so US example, uh, that in their BIM pilot, they doubled their productivity from 5,000 to 10,000 square feet per hour of analyzing space. The kicker with this one, and, and I have intentionally done this in a couple of places, is this is old data. This is, this is in, the, in the grand scheme of technology, this is very old data. This particular study that happened from going from CAD software to the idea of a BIM product happened back in 2009. So in, you know, in 2009, over you know, 10 years ago, people were able to do these things and be able to double their productivity. I would argue that if we were to do a similar type of study today and we were talking about that productivity, that we went from, they might have gone from 5,000 square feet per hour to 10,000 square feet per hour to how big is the building? It got done in an hour, you know, a million square feet in an hour. It just depends on what is there because the idea of area in a BIM or Revit world is it's just a byproduct of the design. and if we're logging it using room objects, area objects, whatever, we are immediately turning that over and it's just done. All that the, the owner has to do is assuming that they've got something that can connect to the, the Revit model is just go connect model to database and we're set. And it's a very quick and easy process. Um, the Imagine side, we've got a partnership with a company called Archibus. They do a facility management system. Their first couple editions of the their, their link to Revit was, it's, it's an R1 product. It was a little, yeah, so it took a little bit more effort. Uh, but after figuring out what worked, what didn't work, and fixing, making things better, it's absolutely to that spot today where it's as simple as, here's my building, here's my, my facilities database for that building. You click a connect button and you're done. So it's, it's very, very fast. And if we think about this of something that there's plenty of people out there doing CAD. I was talking with somebody just yesterday um, where they expect to be working with AutoCAD files for at least the next three to five years. And they've got a heavy uh, BIM initiative going on. They've just got so many buildings and so much area that they're working with. It's going to be at least three to five years before they have the ability 
to make a full on conversion to being mostly Revit. And this isn't being fully converted to Revit, but being mostly Revit based. So when we've got that, that means that there's going to be places where in the CAD world, people are still doing that polylining process. And if we can take something and say, well, 5,000 square feet per hour, and it's a you know, 100,000 square foot building, you know, that time consumed versus just being done. It, this is a big deal. It is a big deal. We go beyond that, and we're working through different things, uh, looking at asset management, same type of thing, where if we go through and start cataloging things, here's one, here's another, transcribe data, type it in again, type it in again. Again, this is, you click a button, transfer data, and it goes on through, and that's the idea of this. Asset management, there was another study done where it took two years worth of what would have normally anticipated been the, the manual population of an asset database, just gone, because they were able to click the buttons and send it over. This one, if you look down there, 2012. So it's a couple years after that 2009 survey, and it's a little bit faster, a little bit better, but it's still, it's something that has been done. It is done. There's nothing unique about it when we're looking at that. It's, it's tried and true technology. It can be done today in any number of different types of facility systems that are out there. It's just a matter of clicking the button, letting these systems talk to each other. If that first step is done that says, yes, we can and will share data. Safe spaces. It's a little bit more important in the current environment, this COVID world that we're in, and it may have been uh, to some owners before now. Now, healthcare is a bit of a different world. I've got uh, a little bit of more of my, my heart and soul to the healthcare side of things, but it is a, it is a point. You know, inadequate van ventilation, even where I am, some school districts have buildings that are up to date and have good ventilation. Some school districts or specific buildings within school districts don't have up-to-date uh, equipment and filters and things like that going through their spaces. So this becomes a problem. If we're going into that BIM world, we start to have the data where we can analyze all of these things to make sure that those spaces are safe. If we're looking at the, the classroom example, the, the image that's over there on the side, um, there, there's an animation that sits behind it. We won't not be showing it here, but we're able to calculate and say from these students that are sitting at their desks as they exhale where are where is the air the particulates that are being exhaled going and if we have them at the core of what we're doing in a building we have the raw data needed to be able to trace and figure out what is happening inside a space based off of various conditions if we move a you know an inlet or an outlet from point A to point B, what happens? If somebody opens a window, what happens? There are the ability, it's you know, computational fuel fluid design, CFD analysis, will be able to go through here and tell us what is happening in these different places. And then if we're able to uh, design the room, design the building so that we have some consistency in the different spaces, then we can control and make sure that all the particulates, the things that are going in through the air are going in a known prescribed place, in a known prescribed direction, and we can reduce that, that risk that people might have of you know, catching germs or things along those lines. Historically, when we're looking at it from a, a hospital standpoint, it was all about the same concept, but it was wanting to get the particulates away from a body that's on an operating table. This is an example of something we did a number of years ago where we were analyzing an operating room to be able to say, where is air going inside this space? And what can we do to change the location of equipment, of diffusers, of things, so that we can control the air and make sure it's always going away from the operating table? And by doing so, reduce the possibility of having you know, infectious things get into a body that's open up on an operating table. Uh, there's, you know, as much as we love to think that hospitals are the most cleanest place in the world, it's also where all the, the ill people are at. So we need to pay close attention to that. If we can do things to reduce infection, then all the better. You know, one study said we could reduce near as much as 100,000 deaths per year due to healthcare associated illnesses, as the text says there, if we can have a better, healthier, more controlled environment like what we're talking about here. And this is all possible. Now, does every owner want this? Yeah, 
a year ago, I'd say probably not on everybody's you know, front and center on their mind. Today, a little bit of a different story. So those are some of those things that based off that space and asset of the types of things that they're looking for and why they're looking for it. Now, how do we go about doing that? If we wanna have the space and asset information making its way from a Revit model to a facility management solution, how do we get there? There's, there's a few different ways we can go about doing it. One of the first questions we have to ask though is what technology is your owner using to manage their facility? And that drives a lot of what comes later because if, if I'm in a, a Revit model and my owner is managing their facility using spreadsheets, I, I talked to one, uh, it's a couple years ago now, there's a school district that was doing everything, they were just tracking everything in spreadsheets. Okay, um, but if we're doing that, then there's no, there's no direct connection, bi-directional associativity or things that are going between the spreadsheet and the data in Revit probably. Uh, so what can we do instead? Well, if there's something that can be done to be able to import export data, there's a few different possibilities. Um, from an Autodesk standpoint, there's a free set of tools out there, the BIM interoperability tools, that would allow you to take the data that you've got in Revit, export it in any number of ways, but in particular a Kobe data format, and then Kobe can go into virtually any facility system anywhere. Kobe, for all intents and purposes, ends up being a glorified very detailed, potentially very detailed spreadsheet. Uh, it's, it's got specific formatting and names and things that come along with it. So it's, it is a data standard that we're exporting to and it's communicated via spreadsheets or CSV files sometimes. Uh, and this BIM, in BIM interoperability tools is a set of tools for Revit that helps you get the data from point A to point B. On the Imagine side, we've got a piece of software that we have called Clarity and it does all sorts of extra things, but one of the items it does is it can take all of the data from your Revit models and pull it into a Microsoft SQL SQL database. Once it's in a SQL database, then it's, it's unlocked, it's able to go wherever you need it to be, and we can do different types of uh, data translations to go from SQL to anything, whether your owner is also using SQL, your owner is using Oracle, Microsoft Access, spreadsheets, whatever. It gets it, you know, quote unquote, unlocked from Revit into a, a more open and understood data format, which is SQL. And so those are two examples. There's others that'll be out there, but there's those two examples of types of things that can be utilized to take your data from a, a BIM environment to something that is more available. Now, that's good, right? It's, it's a whole lot better, a whole lot better than going through and manually transcribing things. If you were to give somebody a, a a sheet, you know, the documentation set of your as builds and say, okay, go ahead and start data entry and typing things into different forms for the database for your facility system it takes a lot of time to get that done. And if we can just do this type of import export, that's good. It, it tends to be a one way type of process. It doesn't have to be, but it tends to be a one way process. We export from Revit to, to Kobe to SQL to whatever, and then make its way into the other system and it's a one-time data import, saves weeks to years of time, which is good. And it's been done, has been done, and is, I won't say it's a standard necessarily, but it's been done for decades now and it's not a big deal. Where we can go and get better is depending on the solution that your owner uses, if we can have a direct read or write to the BIM, the model to Revit, that's going to be better. But not every solution out there can. Uh, you know, again, we've got Archibus, FM Systems, Maximo. Uh, those in all have the, the ability to read and write directly to, to Revit. So that'll be the place where you don't have to bother figuring out your Kobe data formats and saying, OK, let's export. It's a matter of saying, here's my room number. Here's the room number data field that needs to go inside my facility system. Match those up, say go, and it's done. Most of the time, those tools will have the ability to be bi-directional so that if you edit the data inside your facilities database, it can update the information inside the Revit model, which for when we're thinking about things in the, the grand circle of life of BIM or data, depending on how you're looking at it, that idea is that you'll submit an as-built model and then if, if the U is the designer construction team, the owner 
will be doing some data editing. They may not be moving geometry, may moving walls. They might be, but they might not be moving geometry, but they'll be keeping data up to date if, if they're keeping track of, of inhabitants of rooms, of who, who's in this office space, things like that. And they start changing those names. They can push that data back into the model so that when it comes time for a renovation project later on down the line, the people receiving that model to go through that design process for the revision will have current and accurate data. Yeah, we'll want to do some sort of a you know, side verification of, oh, wait, you know what? Somebody really did take down that wall and nobody told us. Stuff happens. But you're going to have a better model to start with as you continue through that next round of the circle of life of renovation on the project. It is better than what we have on the just the, the good side of it all. But that depends on what software the owner has for managing their buildings. We need to know that. It's a simple question to ask. Hey, what do you have for your you know, facility management system? Uh, we're using you know, School Dude for, for managing our facilities. And even without any of that, you can go grab your favorite search engine, search up School Dude, and say, okay, does School Dude work with Revit? Do some looking or ask the other you know, questions if, if you don't want to do the searching on your own. But the data is there. The things that to figure out are there for us to look at. Where I see it all going is the idea of a digital twin. Now, when the first time I ever heard the, the, the title or the name of a digital twin, my thought was this was just somebody's next version of BIM. Uh, the, the word BIM was out there for a while, and the construction people called it virtual design and construction, VDC. VDC is BIM, kind of, sort of. Um, and somebody came up with digital twin. That was just somebody else's way of trying to differentiate themselves, but it's still just BIM. And I'm wrong. That was wrong. The idea of a digital twin in, in Joe's interpretation of it and getting away from formal definitions and things like that is the difference between BIM and digital twin is that a digital twin is actually, well, it says here, it's actually taking that BIM and putting it to use. It's doing more than just saying, here's my model. It's having that model be alive through the life of the building. <coughs> Excuse me. It's, it's taking the people, the places, the processes, the things that are happening inside the building and feeding that data actively back and forth. So that whether we're talking about point clouds, we're talking about 3D pictures, we're talking about the internet of things, all these sorts of sensors and devices that are pushing data back and forth to be able to give you a live view of the, the real world in your virtual environment. So it's taking all these things that we're talking about, your facility management system, your sensors, all the different sources of data that can come into managing a building and actively using them all. We're having digital twin conversations with manufacturers wanting to create digital twins of their, their factory lines, their assembly lines, to be able to know, what, you know what's the, the current efficiency of the, the line of this piece of equipment, when's the you know, maintenance coming around, where are people uh, clustered in our you know, manufacturing process so that we know where are, where are the places that we need to change our process to make it safer for people that are working on our, in our factories. Uh, people that are looking at, there's a, <clears throat> I wasn't involved with it, but I was watching a, a video and an article about a group that had created a digital twin, or at least the framework for a digital twin, for the entire city of Shanghai uh, and how they were technically going through that process and what they were going to be doing with that of digital twins that are in, of other places internationally to be able to simulate and calculate what's happening with various floodplains and all sorts of great things. But where I see it going is if we can get to the spot where we're actively using them to get things done and we're actively integrating it with all of these other data sources, that's digital twin. It's more than just them. It's putting it to use. As we're looking at that and thinking about different things, it's, it's going to be contingent on the Internet of Things, on IoT, whether we're talking about you know, smart light bulbs and different types of hardware. There was uh, probably about 15 years ago now, there was a university in Florida that I was talking to where they had their light fixtures integrated into their IT network, even 15 years ago. Now, it was only in one building. It was the tech building. It's where they're testing everything. But if it was done 15 years ago, then there's a little bit more of a reality to it here. 
uh, different beacons of being able to track mobile equipment going through buildings. That'll be Internet of Things. Sensors on mechanical electrical equipment. Um, it can be wired. It can be wireless. But the idea is if you're going with digital twin, if we're taking BIM to the next level, we do have to have some level of integration with Internet of Things, with all of these different sensors that are out there. If we've got the sensors, if we've got the Internet of Things, um, other possibilities, other things that are coming around. If you were paying attention to Autodesk University a month ago now, close to that, uh, one of the things that Autodesk was talking about was a new product. It's a beta that they have called Autodesk Tandem. There's not a whole lot of data out there about it right now, but the idea of Tandem is to give us a way for uh, taking data from all sorts of various sources, integrating it into a, a single place, and if need be, translating it and sending it on. Um, if you're interested in that, I'd say go, go ahead and look it up. There's a little bit of information that's out there right now. It was just announced at AU. Um, and again, very, I would say, early beta, but it's the, the Autodesk step into that world of what are we going to do with sharing data and communicating things and moving toward that idea of a digital twin. So if you're interested, maybe something a little bit of homework to take going from here and moving forward. When we're transferring that data, though, whether you're talking about something like Tandem, whether you're talking about the direct bi-directional linkages that we have with some facility software, or if we're talking about the one-way push, any of those things that we're looking at, there needs to be a little bit of thought that has to go into how is this data transfer going to happen. It's not to say that the designers or the contractors have to do it, but we have to have the conversation so that the appropriate pieces of data can exist in BIM in whatever data source so that the correct items get uh, populated when that transition happens. So if we're looking at things like left-hand side, maybe is the data sheet of what types of data we have available in Revit. The right-hand side might be what the owner wants to have to be able to understand things. I've got it linked here to a BIM 360 world. It doesn't matter. It could be anything. When we're doing that, it's just, it's a, overall is a simple process but it does take some time and needs to be thought through of what things go to where. So when we're creating that unique ID number, LI22135, where is it coming from? And it's possible to take those separate pieces of data from one source, BIM, Revit, whatever, and through the translation process, say, when I assemble the unique ID number for this room in whatever system, a BIM 360 system, Archibus, Maximo, whatever, we say take these fields, assemble them in that way to develop this number. And that it's it's a simple process, it's data management, it's out there, but it needs to be thought of. If we're looking at these things and you need a specific code to be able to build that unique identifier, we need to make sure that a parameter, at least the parameter field exists in Revit to be able to move in that direction. And once that happens, we just need to make sure it's set up as a standard. If you don't have standards, it's not going to happen. And those standards have to be largely, I'll say, driven by the owner. The contractors and designers can help out with that process to make sure that the standards are there, offer it up as a service, consulting work, whatever it might happen to be. I know it's something that we often do as well. But what are those standards so that you can have this repeatable process? If you've got that repeatable process, then things really start to happen. They start to move forward. And from there, we can get to that idea of implementing a BIM for owner. It takes data from all sorts of places, wherever it might happen to be, your people, your processes, your standards that are using the data and bring it all blended together so you can have BIM for facilities management. As it says, it's not rocket science, but it does take thought. It's not going to happen you know, naturally, organically. It will take some distinct intentional action on our part to pull all these things together, to ask some of these questions to understand what's happening. And as we're looking at that, one of the things that, that comes around, mostly I've got this slide because I like the, the image on the right, but there's, there's a lot that has to be done. We've got all these things that are out there. You're going to add this to my list of what I've got to be thinking about as well. Well, delegate, make sure you're bringing other people into it. But if we're looking at this and saying there's Joe mentioned at the beginning of this presentation that we can put any piece of data you want into a model. That's kind of overwhelming. 
uh, we had a, a customer of ours came to us at one point in time saying, hey, we're working with a contractor, they're using BIM, and they're using Revit. They said that they can take anything we want and put it into the model. So what do we want in the model? You know, the owner was asking us. It's like, well, let's, let's break it down a little bit to make sure we've got only the things that matter. And what I'll say is you've got three questions here that will drive that simplification process. Start off by saying, what do you need? What are you using? And if you had your imaginary best possible world, what would you have at your fingertips? Cool. Okay, now that we've got that list, who's going to be responsible for collecting it? Is it the designers putting that information in the model at the beginning? Is it the contractors? Is it the owner or somebody walking the site at some point in time? How is it going to be collected? And then probably the most important question is who's going to be keeping that data up to date? If you don't have anybody that's going to commit to keeping something up to date, it's actually probably not really all that important after all. And start back up top and say, okay, is this really important? And if you, Joe, think that this is really important, then you need to take ownership of it. And if you're not willing to take ownership of it, then it's not really that important to you. And start working through this. And just cycling through these questions will get you to a spot where you've got something that's a little bit more actionable. And by actionable, take a building. You, know, you don't have to start with the entire campus and moving everything over all at once. That uh, owner organization I mentioned, they're three to five years before they get to probably even just a majority of Revit data inside their collection of buildings. Granted, they've got a lot of square footage, but still, it's, it's going to take some time. So pick a building. Give it a go. Model it up. It's, if you're on the owner side, just try it. See what you get out of it. What worked? What didn't? What did you like? What... Where's the benefits that you see coming from this? And now that you've got a model, you might have some things that click off in your head and say, oh, wait a minute, I can do X and get to that next spot. Because when you get to that next spot, then you'll be able to identify what are you going to do again? What was worth doing? What are you saying? Okay, that hurt. I'm not going to do it again. I, my Myself and, and actually my boss, my VP, are fond of saying, we'll try just about anything once if we've got a justification for it. We may not do it a second time. But let's give it a try once if we've got a good enough justification for doing that thing. So what will you do? What will you not do? What are you going to try to tweak a little bit and, and go at it again? It's, it's the old idea. Of we, we start small, but do start somewhere. You, you just got to dip your toe in. You don't have to go full bore. Dip your toe in a little bit and execute on that plan. And make sure that you know that you're not doing it alone. Set it up. Go through pilot projects. Get some training if you need to. Uh, your cells delivering or receiving consulting. Get some help with that idea of data migration, connecting the different systems together. What are those rules that have to be set up to allow your BIM and your facilities databases to talk to each other? Set up some various workshops where you're bringing multiple people in to work with you on this overall process. There's a lot going on through there, but it's just a matter of take the first step. Uh, you, you might not be exactly on target, but you'll be closer than you were if you didn't move at all. Take that next step. So with that, I'll say that's, that's a lot of information to go through. I'll say thank you very much for the time that we've had to be able to talk through this. I'd like to take it through the Q&A. So if you've got the questions, please hurriedly type them into that Q&A panel. Let's get some of the some of the questions that you have answered. <laughs> great, yeah, great presentation, Joe. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so you just turn up your screen there. Great, so we can... We can have a little chat here. So okay. we do have uh, we have about 11 minutes left. Um, real, I really enjoyed it. I mean, it's such an important subject. It's uh, the whole concept of digital twins and using information better for asset management. It's a, it's a real hot topic right now. And I know a lot of our members who are owners are very interested in the subject. And uh, I want to remind everybody, we have an event coming uh, January 21st uh, that has a similar uh, focus around, um, it's the Digital Owners Summit that we do uh, regularly. So tune in for that as well. Check our website. Um, so we, we had a, a number of questions here. So please get your questions in. <clears throat> one, one question that came up uh, early on was, uh, what built asset information do owners request from the contractors and their supply chain to ensure optimal operational performance? Well, if we're looking at that, it will depend on the, the nature of the building that's in play. Uh, some owners will really want to have heavy emphasis on, we'll say, the mechanical HVAC equipment, uh, maybe some of the electrical or other pieces. So it's, it's very dependent on the building. If we're looking at something that is uh, a museum, 
not only will they care very heavily about the, the air quality and what's happening through there, they'll care a lot about what is this specific light that we're using to illuminate a certain area of the museum. Um, how are we managing all those things? So the, the biggest things will tend, tend to be uh, mechanical and electrical. And the information from their typical stuff will be your know, manufacturer name, model, uh, if possible, maybe a, a link or a hyperlink to maintenance procedures that we'll have through there. Um, so there's a big, big difference with building typologies, I guess. A hospital is going to have a whole separate asset list from a commercial office right. or a residential project or a campus. Um, and I would imagine with, I mean, the size of Imagine, how many customers you have and how, how many, I'm sure there's lots right. of interest around that subject matter. You've encountered a lot of these different types of projects. Is there is there somewhere to look where you can uh, get information on the on the various uh, examples of asset lists or areas of focus by project typology? Do you have that information? Is there can you go to BOMA right. or some other organization focused on on asset management where you um, can you can find I, these examples? Yeah, we might be able to get some stuff from from BOMA. I would say I'd have to look at that from the imaginative side as we're looking at this. We're we're not often coming to the table with saying, oh, you're a hospital, you care about this. Um, we're treating each owner as a unique environment and we'll have some of the, the standard questions that we'll be asking as we're going through it, but we don't have a, a standard unified list of you're this type of building, you're, you're, you're a public entity, so you care about the number of chairs and you're a corporate private entity, you don't care about chairs. Um, which actually is something there was a zoo we were working with. They, they cared about every single folding chair because they had to call them into their asset list. But it, it becomes something that we're on our side, we're just asking each and every one individually of, hey, owner, what are you tracking today? And given the opportunity, what else would you like to track? Right. And Kobe, I mean, the, for clarity, an asset list is kind of different from Kobe. Kobe's more of a, a, a data schema where you can collect the information, put it into the schema, and then push it to, to systems, right? Or can, maybe you can clarify a little bit what uh, what Kobe is and, right. and explain that. Yeah, Kobe is exactly that. It's a data schema. Uh, it's a subset of IFC, but it, it is a data format. So you can take it. It's like a DXF for facilities data, if you want to call it that. It's the common data format that could go anywhere. It's like IFC for exchanging model data. This is just the text-based side of data. So that communication can happen between various systems. There was a, there was a question about, I mean, are, do, do you find that owners are storing uh, information related to the asset directly in a Kobe spreadsheet, like in Excel, or is it more used as a vehicle uh, to transport data and exchange it? I mean, what- As, what, as a vehicle. It, it's right. a transfer state. We're not seeing people use Kobe as the source of maintaining data. They're using it as a translation process from one system to another. And then, and, and are you seeing Kobe being used in, in Canada and the US pretty extensively? Is it still, I mean, it's been around for a long time and I'm not sure if it's really gotten a lot of traction yeah. in the market. Uh, I would say Kobe is like a lot of standards. If you talk to somebody and say, hey, do you use Kobe? It's like, yes, we do. And the possibility of Kobe is huge. I mean, it's every possible piece of data about a building that you might ever someday choose to use. And people are using, well, we use Kobe, but only this 5%. Um, is it pervasive everywhere? No. Um, and the people that do use it just use a, a subset of what's possible inside that, that data standard. Uh, as a percentage, I'd be hard pressed if I were to guess at it right now. I'd say it's certainly less than 50%, maybe more than 25% that actively use Kobe. Most uh, of regarding uh, ISO 19650, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with this this standard that kind of came out of the UK level two requirements and it's now morphed into an ISO an ISO standard and it's really about data the process of data collection over the over the life cycle of a project for delivering data to the owner. Right. Um, the question here was uh, the ISO standard refers to concepts such as owner's information requirements, project information requirements, asset information requirements. Etc. Are you starting to align your workflows to this or a, another standard? I would say starting to would be the the fair statement. Um, like in the design side, um, many owners 
will say, yes, we follow a standard, we follow my standard because I like it. And then to pull, to create their standard, they will pull from pieces of different things, be it you know, something that, in this case, people might grab from Canvas, grab from AIA, grab from wherever, um, and bring them into their overall process. So pieces of it in places, yes. Um, in all honesty, I'd probably want to do a little bit of a deeper check to some of our more manufacturing customers to see how they are going with it. I have not asked that specific question, but generally speaking, manufacturers will jump onto those types of standards before other owner agencies, in my experience. There was a, a kind of a comment question around the quality of the, of the models that get produced uh, through the design stage. And I guess that would probably include some of the models that get produced um, at the co coordination stage with uh, the supply chain. Uh, do you see that the quality of those models being a bottleneck? Do you think that consultants need to pay more attention to owner requirements at the early stages? Or is it better to you know, focus on design and design coordination and that kind of fluid process and at the end of the project, collect all the necessary asset information and clean up your models for, for use uh, over the, the project life cycle? Right. I would say there's a lot more of a disconnected workflow when you're going from design to construction than there is when you're going from construction to owners. Um, is generally speaking, when you're going from construction to owners, we've got that as-built model. And in, even if it's a little bit off in places, especially for an owner, it's a, uh, it's a lot better than it would have been from anything else that they received. So at that point, it's taking the, the as-built model and simplifying it so it becomes more useful for the the owners to use over the life of the rest of the building. There is a, a bigger jumble that's happening between design into construction of is the design model directly used for construction or you know, what number of contractors out there say, yeah, that's great, and then build the model from scratch because there is a lack of, of trust of how much of the model really matches the legal construction documents. Well, how much of the building that's actually built matches what the design was at the beginning too is a big question. I mean, the, the level of detail that the, the consultants bring their models to isn't actually what gets built, especially for the mechanical systems where all the assets are. Right. Um, so there, there has to be some sort of back and forth uh, to coordinate that end deliverable right. if the client wants that. Um, there's a question regarding, and maybe that's a good segue, a question regarding point clouds. How do you see point clouds playing a role in all of this, uh, whether it's collecting information about the asset or verifying what's being delivered or potentially even having value uh, as a point cloud for facilities management? I see it growing and doing nothing but getting more and more viable as time goes on. Um, used to be the technology, the laser scanners to be able to capture the point cloud were six figure investments. And it was mm -hmm. there was a cost, a barrier to get into that industry because of cost. Uh, technology is doing what technology is does. Devices are getting smaller and cheaper. Uh, to the point where, what is it, the iPhone 12 Pro has, you know, laser scanning type capabilities in, incorporated into it. It's questionable for, and I have yet to see reliable data for how accurate it is, but there's also a question of how accurate do you need it to be. Um, plenty of things from co companies like Leica Geosystems that are putting out uh, various types of scanners to get data to make it that much easier. You can put on a backpack and just walk down hallways and capture information turn all that information into something that can be captured and put into your facility so that people can look at it without actually having to go there. Um, turn that and drop it into Apple Maps for wayfinding to be able to say, how do I get from point A to point B? Is, I think there's a lot of value coming from that. It's, it's still leading bleeding edge technology as far as owner management of buildings, but it is absolutely there and we're seeing more and more people working with it as time goes on. Um, so re regarding you know all of this, uh, there's a, there's always been a cost to collecting data and turning over data at the end of a project, whether it's a, a pile of paper and then a manual process to put it into a system and utilize it. Uh, and now that you know there's a cost here to manage and collect digital information and organize it and put it into a platform potentially that can be used long term. Uh, but how do you how do you look at the ROI for all of this? I mean, if you're going to stand up uh, a big digital twin platform and a big effort, 
How do you measure the, the return on investment of buying that platform, populating it, setting it up? Are you looking at sort of, you know, operational costs over any period of time? Um, what, what are your, how are your clients justifying that, uh, the thought process to make this investment to modernize their systems? The customers that we've got that are moving into that digital twin wholeheartedly are doing it admittedly right now with you know, pilot projects, test bits, to be able to say, if we take this aspect of our portfolio and work it into digital twin, first off, do we get the benefits from it that we were expecting for being able to control and manage safety to be able to, whatever those things are, you, first step is working with that, that owner operator to understand what are the benefits that they intend or think that they'll get from this idea of a digital twin. Uh, then typical stuff, you go through and figure out what's the cost of being able to go in this direction and what do you think you, if you got what you expect out of it, what's that rough, very gray ROI looking like? But then we'll turn that around and take it to the next step of do it in a test pilot and make sure that it actually does what you expected or more or less before you commit to the rest of it. So it's it's the typical, what's the cost? What are my expected values based off of what I want to get out of it? The manufacturer that's looking at optimizing their production lines is going to have a very different ROI than a hospital who's looking at maybe energy costs or infection rates. And, and calculating that gets, it, it, there's an art to it for sure. Right on. Okay, well, we're kind of at the end of our hour here. Joe, I, I really appreciated your uh, your presentation. I thought it was great. Uh, I just want to remind our audience that everything that we do here, all of our uh, content that we generate uh, is published on our website. So this video will be published on our website. It's easy to navigate uh, and find those videos. So uh, about a week from now, go ahead and check out the website. You should be able to find this video to share it with others. And please do that. I mean, if, you're, if you enjoyed this uh, presentation, uh, you know, bring a friend to the organization, share this information with others, tell a friend. Uh, we want to grow this organization because the more people we have involved, the better. Uh, if you want to get involved with CAMBIM, uh, we would love to have you to part participate uh, on the website. There's a section there under think tanks. If you want to get involved with these groups that are kind of re-envisioning best, practice, best practices for the future, including asset management and facilities management and life cycle. Uh, you can sign up there. Uh, there's a number of initiatives. Uh, there's awards, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, all that information is on our website. Joe, thank you so much uh, for the pre presentation. Uh, I also want to thank our, uh, our sponsors again. Uh, we have a number of sponsors that help the organization. Uh, I just want to highlight the Platinum sponsors, which is Autodesk Construction Cloud, uh, SolidCAD, and uh, Building Point. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the CAMBIM team for helping to put on the event. And uh, I think we're just gonna gonna wrap up. So, thanks a lot, Joe. Everybody, have a great day and uh, happy holidays. Thank you all. Thanks.